insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 52. Apologies, thieves, and the ones we lost. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. Besides being tired, how are you doing today, sweetheart? I'm tired, but other than that, I'm okay. How yeah, are you? I'm I'm doing all right. I know we're recording a little bit later than we normally do. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of had a, a busy schedule this weekend, so we, we'll just make do, right? That's what we do. All right. Do we have a full show today? So today on our Disney Detective, uh, my friend and yours, Bob Iger, offers some apologies. Uh, We have a Haunted Mansion thief who gets sentenced. Uh, Then we have uh, Super Bowl news uh, because Patrick Mahomes won the Super Bowl. And where's he going to go? I'm going to Disney World. Yeah, and he did. Mm -hmm. Then in our Star Wars news... Uh, we have some more information on the Star Cruiser Hotel Experience, the, f- the forthcoming hotel experience. Then uh, we'll move on to our entertainment news, where we have some Doctor Strange news. Uh, Pee Wee Herman uh, in the news. You don't hear that too often anymore, no, do you? No, you don't. Um, then we have a lot of Pee Wee Herman news. <laughs> uh, then we'll have a uh, in memoriam. Uh, we... we Lost several people in the last few days, sadly enough. Two today, actually. Yeah. Which is, well, one Friday and one Saturday. Uh, one today, so. So we will we will talk about <clears throat> those we lost and pay our respects. And then we will wrap up with our insightful picks of the week. Are we ready? Let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So our, as you mentioned, our our BFF, <laughs> <laughs> not really, uh, Bob Iger actually had issued an apology uh, to an elementary school for showing The Lion King. So news broke earlier this week that the Walt Disney Company had sent a bill to Emerson Elementary School in Berkeley, California, charging the school a licensing fee for screening last year's remake of The Lion King without permission. Uh, The school had hosted a parent's night out uh, back in November and showed The Lion King, which would was purchased by a parent for the event. So they bought the the DVD and they played it for a loud, a large crowd. Well, Disney got word of what had happened and asked the school to pay $250. Uh, So the story has since made national news and people actually calling out, you know, Disney for, for charging, you know, the school, this $250 where Disney CEO, Bob Iger actually has now, you know, tweeted about it. He went to to Twitter on Thursday and offered an apology uh, to the PTA and promised to donate his own money back to the school's fundraising in order to make up for the the headache. Uh, He said, our company apologizes to the Emerson Elementary School PTA and I will personally donate their fundraise uh, to their fundraising initiatives. Uh, The Parents Night Out event was actually a fundraiser for the school and raised $800. Uh, So the PTA was obviously very frustrated 
that here they're just trying to, you know, raise money. They raise eight hundred dollars and all of a sudden they get a bill for two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, one person had said it is just appalling that an incredibly wealthy corporation is having its licensing agent chase after a PTA having to raise insane amounts of money just to pay teachers, cover financial scholarships and manage school programs. We would be enthusiastic about paying the licensing fee if Disney was willing to have their properties reassess and pay some additional property taxes. <laughs> um, and now, you know, you can actually stream stream it, you know, on Disney Plus. So, right. um, yeah, so that was kind of a... Well, and you know, this this isn't surprising. I mean, we've certainly had our own run-ins just with this podcast alone. Yeah, yeah. With uh, Disney's licensing police and... Uh, right. You know, we've had a couple of occasions where we've disputed it and they've backed down, but mm -hmm. I think they maintain such a ridiculous control over it for, for no reason. I right. Mean, in our instances, they certainly weren't going to lose any money if anything <laughs> right, we, we were, were promoting. <laughs> right, their exactly. Product. Exactly. Um, and clearly they weren't going to lose money for this fundraiser either. Right. It, you know, if anything, you know, were people actually sitting and watching the movie? Was it just kind of on in you know, the background, it wasn't like, it was like a thousand people showed up at the fundraiser. Well, and it's fundraiser. not in theaters anymore <laughs> right, now. Exactly. So, they bought it on DVD. Right. You know, but by the time your movie is out on DVD, who cares how many people you're you're showing it exactly, to? You know? Exactly. Exactly. And this is this just shows that uh, Disney is, is desperate to improve their image, I mm. guess from a, a social responsibility standpoint because they, they are draconian in, in their practices. Yeah. So um, tell us about the next Disney lawsuit. <laughs> so last year, uh, the website Inside the Magic covered a story uh, revolving around a former Walt Disney World employee who was arrested and charged with stealing thousands of dollars in props from the classic attraction, Disney's The Haunted Mansion, and selling the pieces online. Um, PayPal records actually showed over $30,000 was made from the illegal sales. Um, after refusing to plead guilty despite photographic evidence coming to light, the accused, Patrick Spikes, uh, has now entered a plea with the prosecution. Spikes and his accomplice uh, received their sentences in Orange County Court this week, and they were uh, scheduled to stand trial last month, but it was canceled, most likely because of the plea bargain. Um, uh, so, um, so Spikes has to serve 10 years of probation with 250 hours of community service and pay more than $25,000 in restitution, and his accomplice... Uh, is going to be doing five years probation and 150 hours of service. Uh, both men are also never permitted back on Walt Disney World property. Hmm, can't, can't understand why. Um, so Spikes allegedly entered the Magic Kingdom using his old Walt Disney World cast member ID. He and his accomplice reportedly snuck into the backstage area of the park and managed to steal costumes and props from the Haunted Mansion attraction. Um... The theft was valued at over $7,000, but again, PayPal showed the record at being uh, about $30,000 um, through the, the different uh, buyers. Um, you know, one included a dress that sold for $1,000 just on its own. Um, the buyers were allegedly unaware that the items were stolen. Um, he actually uh, had advertised that they were pieces that he had owned and had obviously taken with Disney's permission. Now... So, hang on a second. Let me ask you a question here. <laughs> so, does Disney have a reputation for letting people take property from attractions? Not that I'm aware. Of. It's it's very few and far between because there is the one um, I can't even think of what the the name of, of the store there because uh, I went there the one year that we were down there they had an online presence they also have they sell on on um, eBay and they have their own store and it's stuff that they've acquired right. and it kind of makes you wonder you know but it's older stuff so usually whenever there's a renovation of some sort 
cast members can purchase it, you know, at a at a low cost, and that's probably where they get some of the stuff. But I, you know, but let's be honest. I mean, if yeah. you are a <clears throat> avid Disney or Haunted Mansion fan. Mm-hmm. And you collect high ticket items and right. someone approaches you and tries to sell you something that you know is part of the attraction. You have to know that it's... You know it's not legitimate. Yeah, you knew that it's either a, a fake, you know, or that somebody had sticky fingers and it fell off the truck. Right. You know, in some way, shape or form. Now, the fact that he didn't get jail time but got 10 years probation. Yeah, that's pretty... <laughs> What's the purpose of that? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, $7,000, I'm, I'm thinking he probably, if he had that kind of access, he probably has done a lot more damage than that already. Right, and that's the other thing, too, is that, you know, all right, so the transactions went through. Obviously, eBay can contact, you know, the, the people that bought the stuff. You know, are they going to try and get the stuff back, or is it, uh, well, it's gone, well, and, you know? and, like... You're still receiving stolen goods, whether or not you right. knew it or not is right. irrelevant. Exactly. Like Disney can still take right. the, that property. Yeah, back. and they there was nothing about, you know, Disney reaching out to be like, give us our stuff back. Right. You know, here, we'll give you your, you know, whatever, but Yeah. Interesting. <sighs> yeah. So tell us about uh, the Super Bowl winners. So obviously it's a tradition for football players to celebrate the Super Bowl victory at Disney World. And Patrick Mahomes helped to make the trip a little extra special. After beating the San Francisco 49ers in Sunday's game, the Kansas City Chiefs quarterback visited Florida, the Florida theme park to enjoy the rides and take part in the Magic Kingdom parade. However, he wasn't alone. Disney also partnered with the Make-A-Wish Foundation and helped 10-year-old Nathaniel's dream come true. Patrick and Nathaniel, who are both from Texas, rode Star Wars Ride the Resistance together at Hollywood Studios and appeared in the parade along with Mickey, Minnie, and the rest of the pals. Uh, Considering Nathan is a Kansas City Chiefs fan and that Patrick is his favorite player, it just made the day extra special. Uh, Disney also worked with the Make-A-Wish Foundation to bring 17 other children who dreamed of going to the Super Bowl to the park for the big parade uh in addition disney donated a million dollars to the nonprofit in honor of patrick's performance and disney announced that nathaniel would be joining the mvp in walt disney world during the commercial that played right after their their win so it was cute because in the you know so you see you know Patrick, you just, you know, one year's the MVP. What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disney World. And then they had a shot of Mickey and Minnie with Nathaniel saying, and I'm going too. So that nice. was that was really sweet. Nice. So, now, I don't really have a lot to say about this. I think it's a great experience, mm-hmm. and, and I think it's a wonderful thing they did. However, last year we did do a Super Bowl special, and, and we or we did at least talk about the Super right. Bowl. Right, right. What were your thoughts? Any quick thoughts on any of the uh, commercials that stuck out? Well, it's funny because um, in writing everything, it was kind of like, well, it's been a week already, um, you know, since, you know, we didn't record earlier in the week and and whatnot. Obviously, the commercial that got me and still like I get teary eyed just thinking about it now and seeing it is the Google commercial. Yeah, that one hands down has it was a touchy commercial, but I I don't know what they were selling, though. <laughs> Google. That Google will help you remember, like, that you'll never forget your... See, and your... I think it's a wonderful way to take this whole privacy concern about everyone's worried about Google knowing everything about their life right. and put a positive spin on it. Right. So Google is big brother still, but in a nice way. But in a nice... He'll let you remember that Loretta smiled and snorted and, you know, when she laughed. And, right. Don't you know. ignore the fact that it's watching you <laughs> and it's tracking you and it knows every place that you go. And... Please, between Google and Amazon, <laughs> come on, you All know. Right. But, yeah, there, there were definitely, um, you know, we watched it from beginning to end. And this was really one of the first Super Bowls in a while. Well, since the Eagles were in it. Right. You know, like I usually always end up being the one that's watching it because I'm in various different football pools. Yeah. Yeah, I usually um, don't have money on so, <laughs> right. so I usually if my have team's money. <laughs> not in it, I got no stake in the game. But we watched it and it was It was a good game. It was it was definitely a good usually game. Usually it's a snooze fest by um, halftime. You know, the, the commercials were there were some 
definite funny ones that you Still know like the cheetos one the cheetos one was, was can't good touch this with with can't, mc hammer yeah was awesome. you know i can't do that you know and then the jeep one with uh Bill Murray and yep. Grand Hog Day. That was, that was well you done. You know, too. that was well done. Um, the Amazon Alexa. Uh, one. I'll, I'll, you uh, woke her uh, up. I woke her up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that one was was funny. So there were a lot of you know funny ones. There were you know a couple of different ones that were um, you know tugged at the heartstrings. Obviously Google. Uh, I believe New York Life. You know was the other one that kind of got me. The one that emotional. That was very tasteful was the Verizon one. Mm -hmm, yes. Not all the Verizon ones where they talked about five G and how right, it was going to help right, things. Right. The one where they actually poked fun at those. Right. And basically, you know, the theme of all the the ones earlier than this one right was oh 5g is going to give change this and it's going to change that and it's going to be able to do this right and the one that i'm referring to is the one where they show you know first responders and running the in the buildings and, the, and, and then you know the police right. officers and the soldiers mm -hmm. and and how 5G is not going to change the heroism of these people. Right. That, to me, was a classy ad because mm -hmm. they weren't, at that point in time, that, that was a loss leader for them. They were right. not making any money off of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I give Verizon props for being a class act on that. Yeah. Yeah. And and as for, you know, we we could go a whole half hour, you know, talking about the halftime show. Um, um, yeah, they had a, they, did they sing in that? Cause I didn't, I wasn't really listening to anything. Well, you were upstairs cooking. You were, right. you were heating up stuff. I was actually the only one. And you know what? I got to give props to, to JLo and Shakira. Shakira is 43 years old. JLo is 50 years old. And if I could move like that, I would be getting up there and. If I could move like that, I'd be in traction <laughs> by now. But to be able to, you know, get up there, perform, there are memes going all over the place saying, well, you know what? Last year, Adam Levine was shirtless and people were, ah, ah, you know, like all screaming and nobody was saying for him to put a shirt on or whatever. No, so, but I will say this is the first time in history you had pole dancing at the Super Bowl. You know how hard pole dancing is? Yeah, I do. It's, it's not easy. So to be I able to pay good money for it. <laughs> Stop. It is very athletic to be able to to do that and 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 whatnot. So I give I total props to them. I don't think it's appropriate for the Super Bowl, but I'm not taking away from the physical requirements. You know, of it. but then it, you know you can't say anything about their costumes, and then look at Dallas Cowgirl cheerleaders and tell me that they're not. But I'm not criticizing them for the that. costumes. I'm not it's, saying they had pole dancing at the Super Bowl. So. Moving on to entertainment news. Mm -hmm. Nope, Star Wars news. Oh, Star Wars news. No, we did Star Wars, didn't we? No, we didn't. Oh, okay. All right, whatever. Follow the you, script. You got me all flustered here. You want pole dancing again. That's what your problem. You got me with pole dancing. Anyway. I need a moment. Star Wars. All right. So Disney's Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel video has now been uh, a teaser uh, has come out uh, that reveals some new details and reservations will soon be opening. So the hotel doesn't actually open until 2021, but potential guests will be able to book reservations later this year. Disney World has also provided a new video that further explains the insane immersive experience that they'll be offering to Star Wars fans. Obviously, both Disney World and Disneyland now have Galaxy's Edge um, that are both fully operational because you have both of the rides that are open now. Um, but however, obviously, only the Orlando Park is going to have the hotel experience. Uh, so for Star Wars fans, um, that, you know, have been very excited about Galaxy's Edge. Now this is like giving it that next level of, of plussing. So can I can I play this video or are we going to get threatened by oh, Disney? Oh, I don't know. Again? You can try. <laughs> All right. How about we try and you talk over it while I'm playing Okay, it. sure. You're not talking. Uh, I was waiting for you to start the video so that, you know, we could... 
watch it and um so basically the you know so this goes beyond you know the bells and whistles of what we already know of galaxy's edge um so the hotel is actually also going to have a direct entrance into galaxy's edge in an effort to kind of keep you in that immersive experience um you know besides being in the hotel and being you know in the park um, so while entering the hotel for the first time, guests are going to be put into their own pods that'll take them to the main star cruiser. Um, from there, the atrium of the hotel is going to look like the Star Wars cantina. Sounds very with, invasion of the body snatches when you say it like that. <laughs> right. With a lot going on. Uh, the rooms will have up to five beds, including bunks, uh, that'll look like they were ripped right from the Millennium Falcon. Um, there'll be a main quote unquote window that'll show guests what's going on in space while they're in their room. So kind of like, um, if you go on the cruise ships that have, um, the inside cabins that have, you know, like a fake window, that's basically what they're okay. going to have here so that, you know, it gives the appearance that you're, you know, on, on the ship. Um, so you'll be able to take a tour of the bridge and a cockpit, um, alongside that. They'll also be doing lightsaber training for all ages. And that's just kind of like the surface of the activities that they're going to be doing. Um, guests can interact with crew members, um, and the crew members can also send them on a quest, uh, there's a, a RPG element uh, to everything that, you know, n they haven't really talked about too much um, with it. So it's not clear what's going to happen on these missions. But, you know, the First Order could have spies planted around, um, you know, and that, you know, basically, again, all the windows make it seem like you're, you know, on the ship in space, obviously. Um so for parents and, you know, guests who want to do things outside of the galaxy, far, far away, there are normal things to do, you know, as well. Um, obviously, there'll be bars <laughs> for drinking um, and there'll be a gym uh, where you can work out after having blue or green milk um, and that with so much going on as of right now because of the immersive experience and everything, you're only going to be able to do uh the two days and two night stays at this time. It's not something, and that was something that, you know, they had mentioned when they were first talking about it. It was basically going to be like a short term stay type. Now, did they talk about pricing? Still nothing with, with pricing. So I'm sure as it gets a little bit closer, I can't imagine if each room, you know, has five beds. It's probably like each room is a suite, right? Unless they have something. You know, like smaller rooms. So it's going to cost a fortune. <clears throat> it's going to probably cost a fortune. And it, does it come with a park ticket? I'm guessing probably not. But then again, I don't know. It, it They really haven't said. If it's an immersive experience and it has an entrance to the park, you would think, oh, as part of your stay with us, you'd get it. But more than likely, it's, right. it's not. So, But still, it you know, as more and more you know, comes out, it, it sounds cool. Okay. So well, we'll you certainly, never know. We'll certainly keep our eye on it. Yep. Now's the time for entertainment news. Now. Okay. <laughs> so what's strange going on? So, uh, Dr. Strange, uh, in the multiverse of madness is undergoing some more changes days after news surfaced about uh marvel studios uh looking to uh hire sam remini uh uh to take over because scott dickerson le left sam Raimi. yeah thank you sorry <laughs> it's okay. i'm tired <laughs> so um so now it looks like they're actually um getting some new writers to come in um michael Wal waldern does that sound about right sure we'll look sure thanks one. is uh being tasked to overhaul the script he is currently the showrunner and creator of loki the disney plus series featuring um loki the asgardian god of mischief um prior to that he actually worked on rick and morty um, so he actually takes over for another writer who's the showrunner for Disney's WandaVision. So it sounds like everybody's kind of like 
a lot hopping of, around. Yeah, a lot of cross pollination here. <laughs> you know, and you know, so you know, so it kind of seems like you know, at first, um, I guess what had happened was the first draft of the movie was um, it was actually really going to be Marvel's first scary movie. That's what I remember that was, them talking they about. They were talking about, about yeah. it, and then I guess after they kind of talked about it and whatever, you know, they didn't really want it to be that that horror movie aspect. So now they have this whole rewrite coming in, um, you know, so basically, you know, they're, they still wanted to have some sort of that aspect, but I guess maybe not be as scary. Um, the one uh, person had said, you know, like, I remember being a kid and seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark as a kid and covering my eyes when you saw the faces melt, yep. Yep. or Temple of Dune or Gremlins or Pol- Poltergeist, like there was that scary aspect to it. And now looking at it, it, it's not so scary. So, you know, is that kind of the horror aspect that they're looking for so you know and that those movies were the ones that actually made pg-13 a thing you had your g-rated movies and your pg movies you didn't have anything in between and because of those movies you you got that extra you know you needed that extra rating so it was kind of fun to be scared and it not being too horrific so i think that's what they're trying to to do is to kind of bring it back down a, a level and not have it be this th- ultimate scary, right, you right. know, scary movie. Um, but it's supposed to be hitting theaters next May, so May 2021. Mm. So they, they better get moving they better, on it. Better get moving on the writing, you know. And it and it sounded like from the article that you know that there were you know scenes that were already done, but you know now going back and redoing. So. You know, hopefully, it, it you know they're going to stay Disney, on. Disney on seems track, to be having so. a real problem, you know, keeping people on projects these days. Yeah, yeah. You know? So well, we'll see. Ho- hopefully, it won't hurt the end product. Yeah, yeah. So, what's Pee Wee's next big adventure? So this was a very interesting article that the Hollywood Reporter uh, had, uh, basically on you know the kind of the the backstory and history of, of Pee Wee Herman and and Paul Rubens. Really, um, you know, it's been you know thirty years since Pee Wee's Big Adventure, you know, hit the scenes, um, you know, and the actor who is now you know sixty seven years old. Oh my God! Really? Yeah, and you know he basically became a cult hero um you know with the persona that he that he had um and he's kind of making a comeback in in some way um you know he he still lives out in in hollywood and and stuff um he's actually getting ready to go on tour uh, i believe it's a 25 city uh tour of playing the movie peewee's big adventure and doing like a Q&A, you know, type thing afterwards. Um, and, you know, it's just so funny to to read through, you know, the article because a lot of it, you know, you knew he was part of a the Groundlings, which was a comedy troupe. And he actually had a bunch of different characters. And Pee Wee was kind of the one that, that took off, obviously. Right. And, you know, he would go into meetings and pee- pee- people just thought that, Pee Wee Herman was him. Like he wasn't, you know, he wasn't Paul like he Rubens. He wasn't playing a character. Right, that exactly. That was the real him. Right, that that was, you know, the real him. Um, and, you know, Pee Wee's Big Adventure put Tim Burton on the map, too. That was one of his, you know, first films that, that he did. So it's kind of funny to see where everything's, you know, gone. And, you know, and, and after the movie, you know, so before the movie came out, he had had, you know, he had done his comedy you know, specials and, and stuff like that. And HBO had picked him up in, in 1981. And that was when, you know, the Pee Wee Herman show came out. And then when Pee Wee's Big Adventure came out, he was so, so big at the time. They were like, okay, you know, he basically went to CBS and they were like, you know, what do you want to do? And he's like, I don't know, maybe like a kid's show. And that's when Pee Wee's Playhouse, you know, came to be. So it was kind of funny how it started as this dark humor thing. And it kind of yeah, because his comedy act was not a kid. It was not it a uh, comedy act. No, it was definitely not. It was meant to have the persona of right, you know, a kid's show, but definitely not. You know, it wasn't meant for kids. And then 
you know, to take it to that that next so, extreme and and stuff. So. so this stage show that he's doing here is it a, a like a one man show of. Pee Wee's Big Adventure, or is it his well, story? Well, as right Pee-wee? now he's he hasn't come up with anything yet. Right now he's just taking the movie on. Okay, you know the the plan is to kind of develop something that's in the works, and he's like, you know, because obviously for a while he he wasn't working at all. You know, right. after his his incident in 1991. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, while visiting his parents in Sarasota, Florida, um, he he kind of you know went out for a while and then slowly started you know doing things not as Pee Wee Herman but as Paul Rubens, you know, and and kind of did a bunch of things, you know, in like the early 2000s and stuff. And he was actually you know he was on Gotham. He was on Gotham, and he was perfect for the role. And he on was Gotham. totally perfect for that. And he you know did his little cameo in. Um, uh, the vampire show that we could you narrow that one down? You watch them all. The uh, one creepy paper. Oh yeah, <laughs> things that uh, we do in the dark. Yeah. Or... yeah, the dark one. The dark yeah. one. Um, you know the whole scene where they had all the different vampires that showed up. Paul Rubens played right, right. the vampire that was from Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. So you know, so he's been coming back into you know to certain things, and you know, hopefully. Will you know reemerge and, was, and whatever? That was one of our insightful picks, which obviously didn't do yeah, very well with you. <laughs> I'm tired. I can, <laughs> I don't even know what my name is at this point. So again, it was a really, you know, interesting, you know, historical, you know, yeah. thing to read to to hear, you know, and and to think, you know, to look at him and you know he he still looks like himself, you know, yeah. at that 67, you know, it, it's pretty awesome so i look forward to you know seeing more stuff from him because i always liked him you know back in the day yep the quirkiness of him so so that is it for our entertainment news we will come back with our brief in memoriam so who did we lose dear so earlier this week, uh, Kirk Douglas passed away at the age of 103. Um, so he was, you know, a leading star of Hollywood's golden age. You know, he was a, a superstar, you know, before the, the term even, you know, um, you know, had been coined. Uh, he had actually suffered a stroke back in 1996, um, but had been in really good health, you know, for the most part, you know, since then he was still making public appearances, um, you know, and, you know, coming out and, and supporting, you know, his family, you know, Michael Douglas, you know, cause he's been, uh, you know, in the awards circuit for various different things. And, and, you know, so his dad's been there, um, you know, and really for the most part, you know, had been, you know, out and about, you know, very recently and, and, you know, and been celebrated and, you know, good to see that he had a, a nice full, you know, full life, obviously. Um, he survived by his wife, uh, of 65 years and, and obviously his, uh, uh, his three sons. Um, he actually had a son who had passed away, um, about 10 years ago. Um, so his, uh, surviving sons, Michael, Joel, and, and Peter, um, they actually just had the services, uh, the other day. Um, so there was news, uh, you know, about that, um, to celebrate, you know, Michael has shared, you know, various pictures, um, you know, and when, um, this past December, Michael, obviously who, you know, followed in his father's footsteps where, you know, the other sons didn't, um, had shared a, a photo, um, when he became a, a Golden Globe nominee, um, and it happened to be on his dad's 103rd birthday. So that was really sweet. Um, even in 2018, um, when Michael was inducted into the Hollywood walk of fame, you know, his dad was there and he said, it means so much to me, dad, that you're here today. Thank you for your advice, inspiration. And I'll simply say it with all my heart. I'm so proud to be your son. Um, you know, so just, you know, 
an a you know amazing actor from Spartacus to you know so many other films you know from you know um, he received his first Academy Award nomination in 1950 uh, for The Champion and then in 1953 for uh, The Bad and the Beautiful um, but he actually uh, was awarded in 1996 with an honorary Oscar for 50 years of creative and moral force in the motion picture community and I'm sure tomorrow being um, the Academy Awards, I'm sure they'll be paying tribute, you yeah. know, to him along with obviously, um, you know, others as well. So He'll always be Spartacus to me. Yeah, he was also in a great uh, uh, tele- made for television movie, The Final Countdown, that mm-hmm. I love too. Mm-hmm. So. And he, you know, did Disney movies too. He yep. he did uh, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. So, yeah, he did. yep. Who else did we lose? So another one who we. It was just announced uh, a couple of hours ago was Robert Conrad, uh, the star of television series Wild Wild West, uh, passed away at 84. Uh, His family spokesman said he lived a wonderful long life, and while the family is saddened by his passing, he will forever be in their hearts. Uh, He was born in Chicago in 1935. He worked as a milkman while pursuing a... uh, career at a local nightclub as a singer before moving to L.A. in 1958 and uh, getting a recurring role on the show Hawaiian Eye in 1959. Um, Then obviously he went to star as James T. West in Wild Wild West, which went from 1965 to 1969. Um, And it obviously followed the character of West and Artemis Gordon as the country's first Secret Service agents exploring the West during Ulysses S. Grant administration. Um, After Wild Wild West, he starred in other television shows um, and he had, you know, did some uh, movies as well. And he also had a recording uh, (laughs) career for for a little while in the 50s and the 60s. Um, he said, you know, back in 1988, he had told People Magazine um, <clears throat> that there are three cycles in showbiz uh, while he was filming a, a new show. He said, they either don't know you, they love you, or you've been around so long that they hate you. And he goes, and now I'm starting all over again. Um, so a small private service is actually scheduled for March 5th, uh, March 1st, I'm sorry, which would have been his 85th birthday. And in lieu of flowers, the family um, had requested uh, donations be made to Wounded Warriors Project and the Marine Corps Scholarship Fund. Uh, He's survived by 18 grandchildren and eight children um, who he shares with two of his ex-wives. Wow. So. Loved him on uh, Black Sheep Squadron, too. Mm -hmm. He was great in that. Great actor. Yeah. I was actually just watching a... uh, Wild Wild West this weekend. They played. They played on the weekends. Yeah, yeah. That that was always a show. Like even to this day, you know, just because of the steampunkness. Right. Where back then they didn't call it that, you know. So it's kind of you know that always had me, and you know, and always, you know, remembered him him from that. So. And one more we lost. Yeah, this was this was really um, uh, sad news. Uh, actor Orson Bean, uh, who was a local theater mainstay and who you know rose to fame in the 1950s, you know TV personality, um, died Friday night. Uh, he was actually hit by two cars uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, the story was that his wife uh, was rehearsing a, a play. And he was going to see her and was crossing the street and unfortunately got hit by by two cars. Um, You know, in the 50s and 60s, he was on, you know, what's my line? I've got a secret uh, to tell the truth. Um, The Ed Sullivan show. He, you know, made his way on on Johnny Carson and stuff. And then later he starred, you know, uh, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. He was in uh, Being John Malkovich, also on Desperate Housewives, Um, Two and a Half Men, The Closer, Modern Family, How I Met Your Mother. Um, you know, so he's been, you know, you might not have known his name, but if you saw his face or, you know, you, you would definitely know who he was. Um, 
one of my one of the people I, I I'm friends with on Facebook, um, who's in the movie business, had posted um, a, a clip where there was a pilot that he had done back in I guess it was 1980 something or whatever, and he had given him a call to say, hey, you know, we're testing this pilot, you know, I need you know this grandfather type, would you mind coming and, and doing it? And he said sure, and did it for no money, just you know. Did it to to help out just, a friend yeah, and, a and friend, whatever. Just for so the joy of acting. right, exactly. So you know, just very sad, you know, and and you know, tragic yeah. little you know accident that that it's, happens. It's so. it's a sad way to to go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, that is all we had for our in memoriam. Thankfully, yeah, um, we'll be back with our insightful picks of the week. Mm-hmm. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a show that we both enjoy um, on Netflix, and it is the remake of Lost in Space. Didn't we do this already? I don't know. I didn't have it on my list. I went back through my list. Mm. All right. So we unless you now. did it, I so if not, we're doing it again. So second season, right? <laughs> second so. season. So Lost in Space is an American science fiction television series that is the reimagined version of the 1965 series of the same name, which itself was a reimagined version of the 1812 novel The Swiss Family Robinson. Did you know that? Yeah, that's why they're named the Robinsons. I know. I was could have just like oh. oh no i didn't know that thanks for letting me know <laughs> sorry that wasn't in the script oh okay um so basically it follows the adventures of a family of space colonists whose ship veers off course in the aftermath of aftermath of an impact event that threatens the survival of humanity the robinson family is selected for the 24th mission of the resolute the 24 colonist group um, an interstellar spacecraft carrying selected families to colonize the Alpha Centauri star system. Uh, before they reach their final destination, though, an alien robot breaches the Resolute's hull, and they are forced to evacuate the mothership in a short-range Jupiter spacecraft, and scores of colonists among the Robinsons crash on nearby habitable planets. And that is where they must deal with the strange environment and battle their own personal demons as they search for a way back. Ooh. Do you know why they're the 24th? Why? Because there was 23 before, duh. <sighs> Total dad joke. Wow, I got you on that one. Hook yeah, line you did. Though. <laughs> I went for that. <laughs> So, um, very, very good show. Very well done. Um, what, what's really cool is the, you know, it's a li obviously it's a reimagined version of the, the original TV series. Right. Um, what's neat is the actor that played Will in the original series kind of makes a little cameo in season one and season two. We yeah. actually got to yeah. see him. Uh, so that was kind of... And he's still new, alive, technically. He's in techni cryogenic right. spaces. So they, they didn't technically kill him off, so they had that whole thing. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, you know, so there's a twist where, you know... No spoilers. You know, somebody that was one gender in one series is now a different gender. And, you know, and, and where, you know, the dad was kind of the head of things. Really, it's the mom that's kind of the head of things. So it's, you know, girl it's power. girl power, you know, so it's, it's definitely, you know, interesting, you know, their take on it. Well, and, and what I like about <clears throat> the dynamic between the mom and dad, whereas in the original, the mom took a very, uh, sub, uh, secondary role. Right. Where here the mom is predominant in the brains of the family. Mm -hmm. Right. But they don't diminish the father's no, role. No, because he's they still... offer a more complicated backstory to it. Right, right. But he still plays an equally critical role. So they did a, you know, a gender reversal. Right. But not in a, in a derogatory way. Right. And like the kids have a much, you know bigger role in, yeah. in everything and they're much and, more diverse too right 
Right. So, you know, I, I so think they it's did a very good yeah, job. Yeah, definitely. It. A, you know, and and you know, they kind of left it with a cliffhanger. Um, and I you think know. I actually think the second season they stepped it up a notch. The yes. second season, mm-hmm. you could tell they they certainly invested more. The sets yes. were much more elaborate, mm-hmm. and much more expensive than the yeah. first season. Yeah. yeah, and and the writing I think has mm-hmm. been you know. They, they, of course, the first season, they were kind of bogged down a little bit in, in setting up Origins. Right. And that was the thing, because they were kind of starting fresh. Right, and, right. Because you know. the first season dragged at the beginning. Right. Second half of the season, it got really good. Second season picks up, hitting the ground running and doing and, a fantastic job. And didn't job. slow down nope. at all. It no. constantly, you know, kept yeah. going. And, and, you know, it was nice the last couple of episodes where there were a lot of little twists and turns where you're like, oh, great, this is going right. to happen. And, pshoom, it, you know, it, it completely turned on you. And you're like, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, it was very cool. So it was, it was definitely very cool and, and definitely one of, one of our favorites. So. Yep. Cool, good pick. Even if we might have done it before, but and if we did, it was like a year ago. So still, there you go. Still a good pick. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So my pick this week, I actually changed um, not at the last minute, but at the last minute. My pick this week is a website, blog, and Instagram called the Financial Fix. Um, you can reach it at thefinancialfix.co. It is a blog, uh, an Instagram penned by Dan Fuchs. Dan's a 21-year-old uh, college student who knows the value of a dollar. Despite being a full-time student majoring in computer science with a minor in business administration, Dan manages to maintain multiple streams of income. He doesn't lead an extravagant lifestyle or drive expensive sports cars or buy the most expensive clothes and spend foolishly like so many of the uh, youth of today. Instead, Dan uses these multiple income streams to fuel his real passion in finance. Uh, Since the age of 16, when Dan opened his first brokerage account with the help of his dad, he's had a passion and uh, uniquely insightful grasp of how to make his money work for him. Dan doesn't purport to be a financial expert, but he's had proven success in growing his own money very wisely. It's that passion and experience that Dan brings to the financial fix. After developing his own savings goals, understanding the importance of saving money at a young age, and learning how to grow his money through investments and learning about market strategies and habits, Dan did something exceptional. He chose to share that knowledge so others could benefit from it as well. We had the pleasure of interviewing Dan uh, this past Friday in the studio for our Insights into Teens podcast, and I found him to be an exceptional individual. Not only does he have a unique perspective and foresight nearly unheard of from young people his age, he also is selfless in his determination to educate others on how they too can be successful in finance. Dan's blog, The Financial Fix, at thefinancialfix.co, is a collection of articles, analysis, and personal experiences presented in a down-to-earth, easy-to-understand manner targeted at the average person. Reading his insights into whether or not the Apple Card's the right choice for you, or even his thoughts on Disney Plus and the effect the streaming industry has on market trends in finance, is a breath of fresh air. I learned a lot from Dan uh, in our discussion, More importantly, I think a lot of people who are either not concerned about wealth management, but should be, or uh, are scared of the financial playing field could learn a lot from Dan and his insights. Um, We had a very good time talking to Dan in Mm -hmm. studio. Uh, He was able to convey complex terms of finance in a way that Madison, who's 13, Mm -hmm. understood. Yep. Uh, And he had a great message for you know, everyone, regardless of what your age is. Right. Um, some of his philosophies were spot on with, you know, start your savings as early as possible, mm-hmm. the percentages that you put in your savings. Uh, and his website takes everything that he talked about in, in Friday's podcast and expounds on it even further. So The Financial Fix is a blog by Dan Fuchs, available at thefinancialfix.co. Good pick. So, we're going to hammer on these upcoming events again, right? No, we don't 
don't have to. No. Well, we got to talk about this weekend at least. Well, obviously, if you're watching us live, <laughs> ZoloCon was today, but is also tomorrow, and we will be there tomorrow, and someone will be in cosplay. Hopefully. Hopefully. I, I tried it all on today. Yeah, you tried it on like three or four different times. I had to make sure and... I could get in and get out of it. Right, exactly. So we will be there uh, tomorrow. Then obviously coming up March 13th is Monster Mania at the Crown Plaza Philadelphia Cherry Hill. Um, then the Great Philadelphia Comic Con, April 3rd through the 5th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. Um, and then Darksum Art and Craft is April 19th. And then we got Pop Mania, June 5th through the 7th at the Crown Plaza. You know, I hear that title and I can't help but think I'm just walking <laughs> through a convention with little pop-ups, like pop-up video. <laughs> there you go. That would kind of be cool. <laughs> yeah, so that, that'll be interesting to see because, you know, it's run by the same people that do Monster Mania, Obviously, Monster Mania is always horror monster themed. So here it's basically just a regular comic convention, yep. you know, well, be our first or pop culture first one convention. To, so to be interesting to, to see. And then obviously Keystone Comic Con in August and then RetroCon in September. So And that's all of our major announcements. Whew. Yep. So how can people talk to us? They could email us. At? At comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. On YouTube at youtube.com backslash insights into things. You can get our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Obviously, our audio podcasts are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Or you can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Before we do go, I want to uh, offer a quick apology to uh, those who subscribe to our video podcast. Uh, it was it was discovered this past week that we did have a technical issue with uh, one of the service providers that we were using, and our video podcast hasn't been updated yeah. since the episode 40 something now uh oh that's a um, lot of episodes that's a lot of episodes all of our video episodes are available on the youtube channel um but if you're subscribed you will still you will start getting uh updates on these effective this week so my apologies for that i'll i will try to be a little more in touch with that we'll forgive you i appreciate that anytime and i think that's it we're done that's it all right we're out of here have a good one. Thank <laughs> you.